you're ready. So uh, I would like to tell you a story. Um, and this is a story about a product development team at a company called Acme Corporation. Uh, this is our product development team. In the center, we have Tamara. She's the tech lead. Um, and she wants to uh, get the team together to talk about feature flags. They've been using feature flags for a few months now. And uh, she'd like some feedback from the team on, on how they feel like it's been going. Uh, Tam is uh, unabashedly uh, a, a kind of a fan of feature flags. She thinks they are uh, the bee's knees. And uh, she wants to, but she wants to check with the rest, rest of the team. Uh, how, do, how do you feel, team? Uh, Dana on, on the left here, she's one of the developers. Uh, one of the things that she talks about is uh, she's been surprised at how quickly, not just how quickly they've adopted them, but how, uh, how many flags they've started to use and how broadly they've been used. The team originally started using feature flags to do kind of continuous delivery, so they wanted to uh, be able to release half-finished code to production without, uh, without, the, uh, without, their product, uh, without the users uh, seeing this half-finished code. Um, but it turns out that uh, pretty soon after they'd been doing that, uh, Paul, that's uh, Paul the PM on, on the left-hand side there, um, started asking the team, well, you know, we've got this ability to, to use feature flags. Could we do this for A-B tests and all of this uh, continuous experimentation stuff I've been hearing about? And so Dana kind of points out, you know, I thought this was just about uh, devs, but it turns out it's about a lot more than just devs. Lots of people are using these things. Uh, Shane uh, is a bit of a grumpy dev at the back there. And uh, Shane, Shane is not as big a fan of feature flags. So um, he's, one of the things that he's the most worried about recently is how many feature flags the team have, or how many flags they have in their, in their system. And uh, he, he actually came to the meeting with an example. And so he pulls up uh, their feature flagging system and, uh, and highlights this flag here, this enable underscore no underscore GC underscore check uh, feature flag. And he says to the team, uh, what does this flag do? And uh, Tamara looks around. The devs are all kind of scratching their heads a little bit. Paul's not really sure either. Tam thinks, you know, I, th I think this is a garbage collection thing. Um, and Paul's like, no, I think this was when we were mailing checks to people and we had to do this. We were trying out a different type of check that we were mailing. Uh, no, one in, no one knows uh, what this flag does uh, in, in reality. Like, and I think, like, in my experience, this is actually a pretty common thing. I don't know if anyone else has experienced the thing of looking in a feature flagging system and actually not knowing what all of the flags do. Um, and so, so then Shane kind of points out, you know, it's, it's kind of funny for us to say, oh, ha, ha, we don't know what this thing does. Imagine if we were operating this system in production and we were freaking out about uh, memory issues and we wanted to know if this thing does garbage collection stuff or not because we want to turn it off or turn it on. Uh, that's a kind of a more serious, a more serious issue. And um, this was a lot more manageable when it was just uh, Tam's team that were using feature flags. Uh, you could just, you could generally just kind of go and ask Tam the tech lead or Paul the product manager, uh, what does this flag do? And they were generally the people that were creating these flags, and so it was less of a big deal. Uh, but partly because these flags have become so useful, they've now got multiple teams within their engineering organization have started to use this feature flagging system. They've seen how, uh, how much fun and how productive Tam and her team are, and so they've started using this feature flagging system. And so what's happened is it's become OK for there to be flags in the system that no one uh, really knows what they do. Everyone kind of assumes someone probably knows what enable underscore no underscore GC underscore check does. Uh, just Tam doesn't and, and Paul doesn't. Um, and, and so there's this kind of broken windows thing going on, right, where it's become acceptable to look at this list of feature flags and not really understand how all of them work or what, or what they're doing. Um, and Shane thinks, you know, we, like, if we don't nip this in the bud, I think this is going to get worse. Uh, I think Shane probably, probably has a point. Uh, Shane continues his discussion on why he doesn't like feature flags. And you know what? It's not just managing them. Uh, it's also the, the impact on our code base. So um, every time they add one of these feature flags to the system, they need to add uh, an if-else statement to their code. That's generally how they do this. They're like, if feature on, do this. Otherwise, otherwise do this other thing. And you know, Shane points out, I'm, I've been on this team for a couple of years, and I'm really proud of how much we focus on the internal quality of our code base. We do a lot to keep our code maintainable and manageable. 
and understandable. But when we're adding feature flags to our system, we just don't stick to our guns. We just put in another conditional statement and, and, and move on. It's like it's not real code, but it is real code. And we've got so many of them, and it's starting to feel like this when I look at some of our code. It feels like we're building spaghetti code over here. Uh, you know, I, I'm trying to understand what this thing does, and it's like, well, if this flag is on, and then this flag is off, then this thing will happen over here. And then later on, when I do this thing, depending on that flag, this thing over here might have a different effect. So um, this is the kind of thing that they've been striving to avoid with a lot of their practices, uh, and it's starting to feel like it's all, it's all coming apart. So Shane's not a fan. OK, so, so um, that's the end of our, our little story for now. Um, so I, I think feature flags are awesome. Um, but I also think they're very strong magic. And um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about why they're so strong. Uh, and I think what Tam's team is starting to realize is what I've seen a lot of teams start to realize, um, that these things are very beneficial, but they come with a lot of costs, as, as Adil mentioned. Um, now, the good, good news is uh, Tam's team are not the first team to, to walk this road. Um, so I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to, to work with a bunch of teams going through these challenges. Um, and you know, it turns out there's some pretty common uh, problems, and there's also some pretty common solutions for how, how, to, make, uh, how to make the pain less painful. Um, and so that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we're going to be talking about how do you uh, succeed with this good tool? How do you cope with uh, the situation where the flags that you're using are growing over time because they're useful and because they're beneficial. Uh, a little bit about me. My name is, is uh, Pete. I'm an independent uh, consultant. Um, and before that, I worked as a product engineer for a few different startups. Uh, and as Adil said, I spent six, uh, six years working as a consultant at ThoughtWorks. Um, and while I was at ThoughtWorks, I, uh, as a consultant, one of the really nice things is you get to work on a diff bunch of different projects, different industries, uh, different, different size companies. Uh, generally, the more kind of, I think you said traditional, traditionally sized enterprise companies, um, which is very interesting, very interesting things you learn. And um, ThoughtWorks is really obsessed with uh, continuous delivery. They literally wrote the book on continuous delivery. Um, it's a really good book. You should read it. Uh, it's a little bit dated now, but it's still, uh, you know, the book. Um, and as part of doing continuous delivery uh, on all of these projects at ThoughtWorks, we used a bunch of other practices that enable continuous delivery, so uh, trunk-based development and branch by abstraction. And all of those practices are powered by feature flags. So uh, what that means is I got to see a bunch of different teams uh, learning how to use feature flags often for the first time and going through all of the similar pains that, that Tam's team is going through. Um, and so what I'm going to do today is spend some time talking about uh, some of the things that I've learned from, uh, from working with all these teams. Uh, so let's get started. Um, this is kind of like a, a nice, small, intimate group. And uh, it's much more fun uh, talking to each other than just you like staring at me talking at you. Uh, I also think that if you've, if you've kind of like made, made the time to come here on, on, on a nice uh, evening um, to listen to me talk, then you probably care about feature flags. You've probably got some experiences, that's at least hopefully some questions. Um, so I want to try and make this as interactive as possible and get all of the information out of your heads, because uh, that makes me look smarter. Um, so as we go along, raise your hand, ask questions, uh, all of that good stuff. Uh, if, we, if we go too far off into the weeds or kind of off on a tangent, I'll probably play time cop and kind of keep us on track because there's you know, conversations we want to have. Um, but, but yeah, that's, I'd love, love for people to, to treat this as an interactive thing. OK, so feature flags. Um, I think that there's this kind of fundamental aspect of feature flags um, that makes it hard for teams to use them. And I think that the problem with feature flags in some ways is that they're too useful. Um, you, feature flag systems can kind of become a victim of their own success because these things are useful and they're also very broadly applicable. And I think this is the thing that a lot of people don't realize when they first start using feature flagging systems. They generally start using them as a single team for a single purpose. So maybe they're just using them for experimentation or they're just using them uh, for some other purpose. And then the way that you're using these flags grows over time, and the number of people using these flags grow over time, and you don't change the way that you're using the flags to, to reflect the new reality. So I think that's what I, what I want to talk about today is, uh, is, is this, the, difference, the different usages uh, and different types of flags and how that affects uh, how you should be using these things. 
So what I see a lot with uh, teams that have been using flags for a while and, uh, with some success is uh, they start using these flags across multiple teams um, for a variety of reasons, as, I, as I've just said. And, um, and there becomes a lot of flags in the system. This is definitely a uh, very common occurrence. When, when things are, are helpful, we get more of them. And uh, I think critically, the count is growing over time. And this is unsustainable, right? Like these things come at a cost, and if there's just more and more and more of them over time, um, that cost is going to really start dragging on the team. So I think there's, there's essentially there's two issues here that, that I want to talk about. So one is like, how do we deal with the fact that we've got multiple teams using these for a variety of purposes? There's a bunch of them. How do we hold these things in our head or at least uh, change the way we think about them? And then the other big issue is how do we stop that count from growing? This is not sustainable to just keep adding more flags to your system. At some point, they'll be more expensive than the value they're delivering. Um, so I'm going to talk about this in kind of two parts. We'll talk about organizing our flags, which is about you know, how to manage like, the broad variety of flags and, and the people using them. Uh, and then we're going to talk about uh, planning for retirement. These, these people are ready to uh, spend the rest of their lives together. Uh, on that beach, uh, we want our flags to maybe have a less happy ending. To, well, happy ending, but maybe I could have used a picture of a funeral home or something. I don't know. Um, we want to keep the number of flags in our system under check. Uh, and we'll start by talking about uh, how do we how do we organize our flags. And I think for for some people, for people who maybe have kind of a neat freak kind of mentality uh, or tendency towards kind of keeping things in order, this is a very pleasant photograph. Every, look at that. There's, it's all so nicely organized. Um, if I wanted to get a certain thing, I'd just go to the file where it is, and I'd open it up, and there would be the thing. I wish our lives were like this. Uh, this is not the picture I see a lot of times when I look at feature flagging systems. Uh, it feels a lot of times a little bit more like this. Um, it's just a big lump of stuff. There's just this huge list, an alphabetically sorted list. That is possibly the least useful way of organizing something. Like, great, I, I could just type in the name of something, but look, it's sorted from A to B to C. Um, so what I see a lot of times is there's no real uh, system of categorizing or uh, breaking these flags into subsets that, that, that I can work with. And what that means is whenever I go into my feature flagging system, I just see this huge alphabetically sorted list of, of stuff, and it's overwhelming, and I don't want to think about it anymore. And I just start to feel like this is just the way it's supposed to be. Um, and so we get to this, this point where it's just we can't hold all this stuff in our head, and uh, it feels really hard. And I think that the key to solving this problem is in uh, coming up with ways to organize and categorize these, uh, these flags that we're working with. So um, what are some ways that we can organize our flags? And wh when I say organize our flags, really what I mean is um, if we talk about kind of like the implementation details, I guess, for this, what I mean is attaching metadata to your flags that lets you slice and dice. So being able to say not just like what's the name of this flag, uh, but what are some other characteristics of this flag? Um, so uh, one characteristic of, of a flag that you can attach to all of your flag is who owns this flag. Uh, which team or person is, uh, is responsible for managing this flag. Um, and that's a very nice way to slice, slice through your system and say, OK, well, I just want to look at all the flags that I care about, the ones I own. In any sort of real deployments, do you ever expect a single person to own these flags? Yeah, that's a good question. So like, what does owner mean? I mean, I think like, yeah, I, I agree that there's not one owner, but I think I think in most organizational cultures, there's something close to like a, a DRI, like a directly responsible individual or something like that. Like someone who you could say is going to make the call on, like someone who you could go to and say, is this flag still in use? Or are, are we ready to, to turn this flag off? Or, or what does this flag do? Someone who can answer some really basic questions and maybe be the first step in the chain of like, you, know, you ask that person, and they're like, ah, yeah, I actually don't know, but you should go and talk to, to Sally over there, because she, I think she was the person that created that flag. So I think it's better. I don't think you're going to get like one owner across the life cycle, but I think you've probably got one person in most cases, I think. But this is an interactive discussion. So like, like, do, do you think that's true, or do you think I'm very happy to be told that, that you have a different perspective? And 
that, Maybe. That PMD, that it's a yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so. Hold that thought a little bit because I think if we talk if we talk about different types of flags, I think that's true for some types yeah. of flags but not others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At what point do you, does this matter? Because because smaller teams uh, typically is not a problem. I think. It yeah. Seems uh, I'm not sure. Well, like for my team, it seems like everyone knows. Uh, we can pick, usually pick out a person. So like, at what scale does this? I mean, I think it ma like at what scale does it matter that you that you have this? I think it's at the scale at which you start feeling the pain, right? Like if you get to the point that you don't always know which, who who the owner is, and I think that's the thing. Is a lot of times these systems grow organically over time. And when you start, there's no like it seems ridiculous to say who owns the flag. There's like two devs on the team, yeah. right? Like it's like right. it's and, like. And when you say like this goes on the feature flag, the feature flag has more than just a boolean. Yes. Right? Yeah. Does this mean it's like a JSON blob that comes back? It's like an object and it has like owner and then it's like a person's name. I think like the, the details of how you implement it are gonna vary because like if you've got a homegrown system, you're gonna uh, do whatever your homegrown system does. If uh, like if you're using split, then I think you'd use tags or something like that. There's different ways to do it, depends on the system. Um, yeah, it's it's kind of and and really it's kind of an implementation detail. The the key thing is there's like conceptually attaching this information to each flag. I've seen uh, I, when I've been working with clients who have a homegrown system, a lot of time they don't have any of this ability to add metadata, and they just literally have like a naming convention of like the first before the first underscore is the team, and then under the second underscore is the type of flag. Like, I mean, it's not great, but it's better than better than nothing, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, so so this is one one way of uh, one way of kind of attaching some information to our flags and helping kind of deal with that cognitive load. Um, another good thing uh, for a, a definitely at a larger scale uh, organization is like what system or code base cares about the status of this flag. Like if I press this button, like what happens? Right? <laughs> like um, and so yeah, again, again larger scale. Uh, a lot of systems, it's like oh well, the monolithic system that does all of our things cares about this flag. Uh, but a lot, a lot of times with like more uh, SOA type organizations or organizations that are using some flags for front end and some flags for for back end systems. This is a useful way, again, to slice and dice. Um, a category which I've seen some systems use and which I think is kind of questionable is like, what's the status of this flag? Are we planning to use it? Are we actively using it? Does it actively change something in a production system? Uh, or has it been retired? So the reason I think this is questionable is um, why is it even in the system unless it's in that middle state? Like, if we're not using it yet, don't put it in the system yet. If it's retired, why is it still in the system kind of cluttering up my view of the system? Um, I think there's cases where it does make sense, like when something's getting ready to be retired. But I, th I think in general, this to me feels like a bit of a smell that we're too scared to actually actively manage our flags and take them out of the system once we're done with them. Uh, and then a, a fourth way of slicing and dicing, which I really I, I, I'm a huge fan of, is categorization of the flag. What type of, what is the use case that this flag is, uh, is working on? Um, and I'll dig into what I mean by categorization. So for me, I break feature flags into these four kind of broad categories. Release toggles, ops toggles, permissions toggles, and uh, experiment toggles or experimentation toggles. Um, and I'll go briefly through which each of these does. So release toggles are essentially the enabler of continuous delivery. This is a feature flag which allows you, which controls access to unfinished code. So this is code that hasn't been released uh, but is deployed into production. It's latent code that's in my production system but no one can access it because the feature flag is off. When I turn the feature flag on for certain people or for all people, the feature is released to those people. So this is used to be very traditional, like this is what I used to call feature flags. This is the only thing that was feature flags. It got me really annoyed when people called these other things feature flags, but I've given up on that. Um, Ops toggles are feature flags which are used to control the behavior of your production software and are managed by operations folks who are operating your software. So I worked at a client who uh, did online retail, and they had incredibly spiky traffic. They had uh, what they called an on-sale event, where their traffic would go from you know, this to this in like seconds, and then drop back down again. And uh, 
it was very interesting. That it's like some of the things they did culturally to deal with that was really, really interesting. And one of the things they did was they had a bunch of uh, toggles that like five minutes before the on sale, they would literally just turn off like bits of the site. They'd be like, no recommendation engine for the next half hour, no, um, you know, no support things, no uh, integration with these third party providers because they just wanted to make sure that nothing broke while they made all of their money because they made all of their money in like that five minutes. And it was actually their client that made the money and their client was literally on the phone for that five minutes, which is really cool. Like in the op center, uh, an artist, this is a, a ticketing company, would be like listening to how much money they were making uh, during this on sale. And if, if they heard an operations person saying, oh um, yeah, we're having a bit of a performance problem, uh, they would be talking to the CEO of the company and asking them uh, why the operations folks didn't have a feature toggle, feature flag. So cool story. I've got more cool stories actually. There's a really cool one as well about uh, uh, an airline company and uh, uh, the car rentals that they integrated with. Um, good use of ops toggles there too. So um, that's ops toggles. Permissions toggles is uh, the ability to control what certain types of user uh, experience on your system. So uh, for example, um, admin features. So if someone is an admin, then you, you let them see a feature. If they're not an admin, you don't. Or if they're a paid customer, you uh, let them not see an ad. If they're not a paid customer, you show them the feature of the advertisement. Um, or if they're an internal user, you show them something that hasn't been released to the general public yet. So uh, basically, if you have permission to see something, you see it. If you don't, you don't. And then the fourth category, which I think is the broadest and actually most exciting kind of, or certainly compelling use for feature flags is experimentation. So this is uh, A-B testing, multivariate testing, uh, canary releasing is kind of a, an interesting variant of this. Uh, this is a essentially, if you're in a randomly assigned cohort of users uh, A, then you will see a feature. If you're in another randomly assigned cohort B, then you won't see a feature. Um, and this now, I think, is the gateway drug. It used to be, in my experience, release toggles that got people starting to use a feature flagging system. I think nowadays they start with experiment toggles a lot of times, and then they start saying, like, oh, we could use these for ops toggles as well. So those are, our, uh, those are the categories that I place uh, feature flags in. Um, and the reason I like to do this, one of the reasons I like to do this is if you combine this categorization scheme with all those other things of like what user, uh, or who's the owner of this flag, uh, what system and cares about this flag, then you can slice and dice in some uh, pretty powerful ways and kind of say, you know, uh, I'm, I'm the PM, what experiment toggles are running in some other product that I don't care about, but I'm kind of interested to see what my PM friends are doing or I'm an operations person, my hair is, fi is on fire, which, op which feature toggles um, work on this system because it's, uh, it's melting down right now. Uh, so it's kind of like a powerful way of, of uh, combining these to slice and dice uh, through that big kind of mess of flags, right? Um, I think the other thing that's really valuable is by in getting intentional and explicit about what the type of, what the use case is for the flag, you can start doing uh, a gut check on is the right person managing the flag. So a deal to your point, you know, for an experiment, uh, for an experimentation toggle, it's, it almost always is going to be the PM who owns that. But if it's an ops toggle, you actually probably don't want the PM owning that. And if the PM does own it, then the operations manager can go in there and say, like, I'm not sure I, I trust Paul to uh, not decide, you know, have a couple of martinis and see what happens when he turns this thing on in prod. Um, that would be a bad cultural thing if people didn't trust each other, but maybe in some organizations that's an issue. Um, so yeah, so it allows you to kind of do a gut check on, on, on who's owning the right things and kind of, and it's not, it just the act of thinking about this gets a lot of other processes going, I think. Like the idea of realizing that these are different types of things that you use differently starts other kind of processes uh, and kind of uh, ideas forming culturally inside of organizations. The big reason I like this categorization scheme in the context of uh, managing your flags and the lifecycle of your flags is uh, if, you, if you think about this, you can actually slice all of these feature flags into two categories. On the top here, you've got long-lived flags, an operations toggle, that thing that turns off the recommendation en engine when you've got like a bunch of load. You're probably going to want that there for a long period of time. The permissions toggle that stops uh, non-admins or that stops uh, unpaid free users from seeing your premium features, that's in your product for years, probably for the entire lifecycle of that feature, right? 
versus a release toggle or an experiment toggle which should not be in your system for a long period of time. If you're doing an A-B test for months, um, I question whether that's an A-B test or I question your grasp of statistics. Um, likewise, release toggles, if, you're, if, you're, if you've got a feature that's so huge that you can't get it out uh, and done and done and released and we're happy and we're going to retire that flag, then, um, then you've got some other issues as well, I think. So by categorizing our flags this way, we're able to slice them into the flags that are going to be in our code base for a long time versus the flags uh, that we should be explicitly planning to retire. And that's, that's the big win of, of this categorization is you, can, you know for a given flag, is this a flag that should be in my system for a long time or is it a flag that I should be planning to retire uh, in the next few days or weeks? Um, yeah? On the permission toggles, mm -hmm. Yeah. This whole area of the product. Like, yeah. How do they think about it? So how granular should that uh, those permissions toggles be? Like is paid versus not paid versus is allowed to see. So. Um, and then if you're gonna like change your pricing, do you just do yeah. or, like change up? Do you like actually change what gets flagged, or do you make your flagging so granular where you can change the pricing whenever you want? Yeah. And just like turn flags on and off. Yeah, I, so I think this is a really, really interesting discussion, right? Because I think it really comes down to what you see the flagging system as being for, like if you're, if you're a huge fan of your feature flagging system and that's where you spend most of your day, you're going to gravitate towards fine-grained control right there, right? And so for that kind of team where someone is driving their product through their feature flagging system, um, I think it probably makes sense for them to have those fine-grained controls versus if it's a team where they just have like admin stuff and they just want to turn on and off admin stuff, then they're not going to care as much. I think that the, the, the key trick, which I would love to get into in more detail uh, this evening, I, I don't think I have time, the key trick is decoupling like the ability that in your code to have fine-grained control from having to have fine-grained feature flags. Because you can have, a, uh, like let's say you've got uh, bronze, a free bronze, like silver, gold membership, right? And as a PM, you want to experiment with, maybe I should try giving this feature to bronze users and see what happens, and then you want to change your mind. I think the instincts for a PM is to just, therefore, make it super granular in the, in the, the feature flagging system and be able to kind of move that stuff around. I, I think that what actually makes more sense is to just have have it super granular in the code and then have an abstraction layer that may be built into your feature flagging system or maybe just in your code that maps like the broad buckets that you have in your feature flagging system is premium, is silver, is gold to the very fine grained things that's in your code base. What you do not want is in your code base if premium level show this thing, right? Because then as a PM you're like, God, I have to, I have to go and talk to my devs to get them to like change it to be is bronze level to try this experiment, right? So if you have like an abstraction layer where the the uh, the code level you're not saying what feature flag is on, you're saying should I show this feature? And there's a there's a abstraction layer that says, oh well today what we're saying is to show the two day free two day shipping option, uh, they have to be in this set of of buckets. Um, then you've got the best of both worlds where like at the, at the placing users into buckets is done very simply and you don't have to keep on moving which bucket a user is in. Um, and then on the code level, you're not thinking about feature flagging at all, which I don't think you should in your code. You're saying, is the current user allowed to get two-day shipping? I think this is like, a, I, like, I should probably stop talking now because I could talk about it for a really, really long time. I think this is the key thing that is really hard for people to understand when they start like embracing feature flagging is it's really easy. It's a super powerful tool, right? Like it's a, it's a sawzall that will do a lot of stuff and it's quite easy to start using it for all the things and do the equivalent of like building half your product in Excel and then someone comes along and is like, oh crap, now all that product's in Excel. So I don't know. I think that was kind of a bit of a rambling. <laughs> I'm not sure I answer the question. So, but uh, I definitely would love to talk about that more because I think it's, it's, it's a super interesting kind of challenge that, that teams have when they start trying to figure out how granular to make this stuff. Uh, yeah. Separate, separate question. But, like, when you talked about statuses of flags, 
Yeah. How does that work within your mind with um, sort of a flag? So like the flag only exists in production. What about in phasing and development? Yeah, that's a good question. So well. is the status like environment specific? I think like my tendency is is I just think about production. Like we're going more and more towards the world of like all this stuff is happening in production anyway. Uh, a good if you've got some good maturity about feature flagging, you're probably doing less stuff in. You're probably thinking less about is this in staging versus prod, versus like you're thinking about is the feature in staging or prod versus like where are, where is the configuration done. Um, I've been thinking a lot about like whether there even makes sense to have staging or prod feature flag. Like shouldn't they just like sh feature flags kind of transcend environments or something? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But you use it specifically only in the context of experiments. Yeah. So when you're, do you recommend to your clients usually that when doing release toggles, either turn it on or turn it off? That's a really good question. I think, like, so should a release toggle be kind of a binary on or off thing? I, th I, I think if you, I think it depends a lot on where, on how you think about features. Um, I think it depends a lot like which camp you came into feature flagging from. Like if you came in from continuous delivery, you think about like what's on in prod or is this feature released in prod? If you came into it from experimentation, anything is, you know, there's this thing that I, I can't remember which company started saying, but like everything is, a, everything is an experiment. Like a technical change is an experiment to see whether it's going to ruin our metrics just as much as a, you know, changing the color of the button or whatever. So I think if you come from that mindset, which I think is probably the right mindset to get to, if you've got that maturity of starting to think of all changes as an experiment and you've got the technical maturity to actually implement that in your infrastructure and monitor it correctly, then I think, yeah, a release toggle, you should, you should treat everything as an experiment that you gradually ramp up on. But I think for most organizations that are getting started, um, the idea of a certain percentage of users getting like a code change and others not, that's not like where it's a dev doing, or it's a tech lead that's thinking like a PM essentially and thinking about statistics and have we reached significance and babysitting a release. A lot of teams aren't, aren't at that maturity level. So I think for them, I would just say, like, just, just consider it like it's like pushing it to prod, except you're not pushing code, you're pressing a button. You know? um, I think it's really like, it's really like the, the convergence of kind of experimentation of technical ideas versus uh, product ideas, I think is, is really interesting. I think that's where we'll be in a few years time. Maybe, yeah, good question. Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving. So, um, okay, so, so, so yeah, so that was the, that was kind of the conclusion of this kind of like, uh, talking about how, how, which are different ways we can organize it. And, and as, I, as I was kind of wrapping up there, I was saying, you know, one of the big benefits of organization is we can identify which, of, which are our short-lived flags and plan to kill them. Uh, sorry, put them into retirement. Um, uh, but before I move on, I wanted to kind of poll the audience to see like, what other techniques do, do folks here have um, that help them kind of organize flags or keep, them, keep, keep it less of an overwhelming kind of pile of stuff? Or did I just cover it all perfectly? Yeah, Pi. Yeah. 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 Like, is it like, is it hot or not? Like, yeah, is it? Yeah. 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 I think that's great. Yeah. Yes, more than that. Yeah. So wh yeah, what about testing? Um, I'll totally honestly, uh, yeah, I could talk about it for way more than now. So I kind of glossed over that aspect. I think it's definitely a, a big, a big part of it. These things come with a cost for sure. Um, yeah. Well, we end up um, doing it for our own code. Uh, this is how test runners they say run this test four times and combination of all these four flags. 
Yeah. 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 I think it's a great technique, and it's also a great reason to keep the number of active flags super tight because that com combinatorially is going to explode really fast, right? And it's also, so that's a really nice reason to add more categories to your flags because you start being able to say, I'm testing the front end. Uh, which flags should I be doing different combinations of for that front end code? And what teams often do is they just eyeball it and they're like, oh yeah, or they go and talk to the tech lead for the front end team or whatever and say, oh, these five flags are the ones that I need to think of. The QA does that. But if the QA can also go into the flagging system itself and say which flags are active right now and uh, the mobile app cares about, that, that gives, that's a lot of power, right? Rather than having to keep it in your head. Yes. Yeah. 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 But it all starts with like realizing that you that attaching kind of metadata or categorization to a flag is kind of gives you this fundamental kind of ability to ask those questions, right? Yeah. So you'd be using like the metadata to <coughs> assist in your code, like tasks and code. I I mean you could you could go that far. Uh, uh, I, I think you, I mean you could do both. So you could go that far and have like um, you know specific like the tests are aware of the metadata and, and, and do clever things, but it could just be a QA that goes into the system and, and looks at the information in that system and decides what kind of manual testing they want to do. Right? So it doesn't doesn't need to be super fancy. Okay, I'm going to move on. So. Um, so yeah, so okay, we already did this. I forgot to move the slide. Um, so planning for retirement, um, if we kind of cast back to what I was saying earlier, um, one of the big problems that we have with these flags, there's a lot of these flags, and um, even worse than us having a lot of them is we're getting more lots of them over time. The count, the count is growing. Um, and as I've said, I think like the biggest reason for this happening is there's just not enough focus on retiring flags and there's not enough discipline or tools or techniques available to a team that's new to feature flagging to understand how to keep that count under tra uh, in, in check. And I think what a lot of teams react to, they have the kind of reaction that Shane has of like, there's too many flags, we need to stop adding more flags. Now, I would say that's, that's not the most productive attitude. I'd say the attitude should be, there's too many flags, but flags are really useful, so let's figure out how we can reduce like, how many flags are in use and, and optimize our throughput. How can we start killing the old flags so we can get more flags in? We like flags, flags are useful, but too many of them is bad, so how can we move the old flags out of the system, basically? So that's what we're gonna talk about. A uh, happy uh, couple here planning for retirement. Um, and I think the, 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 the key to this is identifying those short-lived flags. So this is uh, why I was talking about that. Part of why I was talking about the categorization scheme is, is explicitly identifying uh, which flags in our system shouldn't be around for a long period of time. Now this, like when you put it in big letters on a, on a slide, seems kind of obvious. Like, oh yeah, well if you want to get rid of flags, like figure out which ones you should get rid of. I do not see teams doing this. I see a lot of teams that don't realize that there are short-lived flags and long-lived flags. They see some long-lived flags in their code base, and so they start to think that it's okay for all flags to be long-lived. Or they don't realize that like, the, the distinction between a piece of code or a flag that controls access to admin functionality versus an A-B test, they do everything the same, and so they don't think differently about how to manage these flags and, and kill the, the, the ones that should be retired. So, it seems trite to say, but I think actually as a team or as a developer or as a PM, when you create a flag saying this is a short-lived flag is a really, really big win. Just to start doing that is a, is a really, really big win. Now, once you know that this is a short-lived flag, you can start thinking about ways to retire that flag. Uh, a, a thing that I think is table stakes that most teams use is uh, kind of creating some kind of cleanup ticket or uh, item in there task list or backlog or Jira or whatever, uh, when you create the flag. So when I add a flag to the system, a short-lived flag to the system, I add a to-do to remove the flag. I think that's a pretty straightforward thing. Some teams don't do this. Um, you, sh you should just do this in, in, in almost all cases. And this, this is, like I said, this is table stakes and I think it, it can help, but it's kind of the bare minimum. And, and the reason for that is um, I have, spent a lot of time at 
clients where the cleanup ticket is just at the very top of next sprint's uh, backlog for like six months, right? Like, it's always like, yeah, we really should do that next week. And it, it, it will be done next week, but it's always next week, right? Um, and is this kind of like specific example of the general tech debt malaise that a lot of organizations um, struggle with that we tend to focus uh, on the urgent and don't have time for the important, right? So um, feature, removing your feature flags is kind of a, a version of removing your short-lived feature flags is a, is a kind of a variant of tech debt. And just like other tech debt, it's hard to actually find the time sometimes to carve out the time to do that work. Um, so, so this is kind of like table stakes. Going beyond that, I think something which I see, I, seem, I, I think this is a really nice technique and it's pretty straightforward to do is just when you create a short-lived flag, you've identified this is a short-lived flag and you just put in the flagging system, uh, this flag expires two months from now. So you know, it's uh, in March, if this flag is still here, then we've done a bad job and we failed. And we should feel terribly guilty. Um, we shouldn't feel terribly guilty, uh, failure is okay. Uh, but just saying like which flags have expired in my system is, is like is what is very very powerful I was just talking uh, to someone uh, earlier on this evening about um, a company doing like a purge of the old flags and probably the first thing they did is went through the flagging system saying like oh is this one still in use is this one expired is this one a long-lived flag a short-lived flag if you can just sort by date that's a great win uh, you can also start saying things like or you can start doing things like um, having a big red ugly banner in your flag management UI saying this flag's expired this team should feel um, not happy with themselves I have heard stories of a team that put a time bomb in their system where if you tried to boot um, a service that had an expired flag it just wouldn't boot it would say in very politely uh, I'm using an expired feature flag I do not uh, I, I, I'm not going to run so that is very extreme um, and I wouldn't recommend doing, I think a lot, of cult, a lot of organizations would not be comfortable with doing that. It does force a lot of other things to be good. Like it's kind of like a chaos engineering thing of like if you can handle that, you can probably handle a lot of other things that will happen to you as well. Um, you don't have to be that extreme. You can have the service uh, trigger an alert or log a really annoying log message or uh, you can add unit tests or some kind of thing to your test suite that will fail if it detects an expired flag. So there's other ways to, to deal with this time bomb idea, um, but just the idea of actually giving something an expiration date and doing and whining at you when, you, when, you've, when you've kind of not met that date, I think can be very valuable. I think you had a... Uh, there is one, uh, in a weird way, uh, so some companies, um, for instance, the box, when they created their feature flag system, they had a weird limitation in there that they just could not have Which is exactly what I'm going to talk about. Uh, yeah, sorry about that. No, it's great. It's great. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, they, they, they have the limitation purely because they didn't, didn't design it well. Um, that's they awesome. They could not have more than 56. That's, that's and so it ended up becoming a training game between teams, which is how to keep these slots hostage until oh, wow. you give up your slots. And so that ended up becoming a forced assumption. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. So really bad design, but it ended up having, yeah, at least for time. Serendipitous. Yeah, that's awesome. So uh, at, at a, a very large tech company uh, in Mountain View, they build their own Linux kernel. Um, part of the reason, a very small reason why they do this is they have so many flags on their executables that they hit a limitation in the kernel on how many like, command line arguments you could pass to a process. And so of course, because it's this company, they've made their own kernel. <laughs> So that they could keep adding more flags. So they did not uh, ha have that forcing function because they're like, oh, well, you know, we can't add more than 2,000 feature flags to this process. We should probably uh, rewrite our own custom Linux kernel so we can do that. So kind of a counterexample. I, they probably shouldn't have done that. Um, but yeah, so what you're talking about is uh, what I would call WIP limits, work in progress limits. So, um, so this is a process that comes, or an idea that comes from um, lean manufacturing. So in the 80s, uh, Japanese auto companies like, uh, like Toyota were whipping American car companies' butts at making uh, cheap, reliable cars. And uh, they were using all of these, what's now called lean manufacturing processes. One of the things that they did was focus on throughput, getting things through the factory fast. 
And one of the ways you do that is you reduce the amount of piles of stuff that there are between workstations. And so you focus not on how, how fast can an individual part of the system work, but how fast can the whole system work, partly by saying, I will not allow more than 15 bolts to be in this station. And so everyone focuses on moving the bolts through the system rather than piling them up in the middle where they're producing no value. This idea was uh, then kind of taken and applied to software. Um, and so things like Kanban came about. And, and they say we, the, an engineering team shouldn't be working on more than five things at once because they're not very effective. So we're going to say no more than five stories can be in dev at any one time, or we can't be testing more than two things at a time. And again, that focuses the team on getting things through the system. I said a little bit earlier, I think what we should be doing with feature flags is getting more feature flags through the system. Each of these things, once it gets to, to use and being used, it's delivering value. There's a reason we like using feature flags. So what we should be doing is thinking about how can we get more feature flags through the system. And uh, whip limits, working progress limits is a way of doing that. So the way that you would apply this with feature flags is, uh, as, uh, as, as Box accidentally discovered, limiting how many active flags, active short-lived flags, ideally, a team is allowed to have. And this is an artificial limit in most cases. A team says, we know that having feature flags in our code base is expensive and slows us down. So we will not allow more than 10 active short-lived feature flags in our code base at any one time. Or the team won't have more than 10 under management or something like that. And so what that means is the first 10 get in there pretty quickly. And then uh, pull the PM or someone else wants to add a new feature flag to the system, they can't because the, all the slots are full. And, and as Adil said, so what do they start doing? Other people start helping to move those, uh, retire those active flags to make room for more feature flags. So it has this effect of, in, of aligning incentives. The biggest issue with tech debt, and this is much broader than feature flags, the biggest issue with tech debt is the people who feel the pain, the devs, are not the people who can prioritize fixing the pain, generally the, the product managers. and so. Uh, the devs, are, uh, you know, uh, Shane, the dev, is feeling all this pain from all this spaghetti code, and he wants the cleanup ticket prioritized. Paul, the PM, l really likes Shane, and they, they go out for dinner, and they really like each other, but Paul really wants his features to get into production. And so um, he's not feeling the pain in the same way that Shane does. If Paul starts feeling the pain because he can't add more features to the system, and he really wants to add more, f or more experiments to the system, Paul starts prioritizing the work to move the feature flags, the active feature flags, into retirement so he can get more stuff done. As humans, we're all terribly selfish people. Um, this, this works. Um, so I, this is like my favorite technique for uh, reducing the number of flags, is just artificially saying we'll only have so many flags because it aligns the incentives of the different people working on the system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, where I have the ability, even after I'm done, to turn it off at some you know, horrible point in time when yeah. something happens. Yeah. Have you seen that? Is that yes. like a, a common thing? I don't think it's so. So, is there this thing where like you just want to keep all the feature flags around just in case they're handy at some point in the future? It's this kind of hoarder mentality, right? Like, oh, I've got 500 chopsticks in my like rest, like takeaway chopsticks, but I'll put another two in my junk drawer because you never know. Um, yeah, I've definitely seen that happen where people are like, there was this one time where the ops people wanted to use the feature toggle and it had been retired. And so, you know, because that happened this one time, we will now forever on always uh, keep all our feature flags. I think it comes down to aligned incentives, right, where the ops team don't feel the pain of managing those flags. And so it's easy for them. It's a freebie for them to basically say, just keep all the flags. No big deal. They're not feeling the pain of managing the flags. So I think it comes down to like a conversation of like, this costs us to, to do this and, and articulating the, the cost of something and a much broader kind of problem than just the speeds of flags. So I have seen it. I haven't seen it. I haven't seen it that much. Um, I think it depends a little bit on. Uh, I, yeah, I think a lot of it depends on the, just the, the culture of the company and, and where, where, where they are. Um, in general, I advise people to not use, when you create a feature flag, say what it's for, it's very rare that the thing that you want to turn into an ops toggle is actually fit for purpose. You might do the job in a pinch, 
but you probably want to actually structure it a different way. You certainly want to write the code a different way if it's going to be in your code base for years and years. You probably want to manage it a different way. So um, again, it's like it, once you start getting this, this tool available, you want to use it for all the things, and you just have to be aware that like, you shouldn't use the, the same thing, use different types of thing the same way just because they look the same when you get started with them. OK, I'm going to keep us moving. Um, so those are some of the things I like to do. Interested to see if there's other kind of cool stories uh, uh, or other techniques that you've seen that have allowed teams to uh, retire the number of flags they have. Yeah. Uh, in previous companies, I mean, and two of our customers actually, um, there's seasonality. Um, mm. Yeah, uh, the, the time, code freeze. Uh, coding, yeah. You're just uh, building for, or you're stabilizing the system. Yeah. In those times, you end up working a lot on infrastructure and stuff like that. Yeah. Like yeah. Clean up. So that ends up being more of a tutorial. Yeah. Strategy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've not, definitely not seen that too. Yeah, yeah. I think so that's like a broader technique for just like how do we pay down tech debt in teams where it's, there's seasonality. Um, I've, I've seen, they used to be very common in more waterfall organizations because you had like four months before the next release. So for the first three months, you'd like come up with all this cool stuff, and then in the last month, you panic. So, yeah. Other techniques. Okay, I'm going to move us on. So we talked a little bit about short-lived flags. Uh, some of the questions were like, you know, how do we deal with these long-lived flags? This is uh, definitely another another hour-long talk, at least. Uh, I'm going to give like the, the the very short Cliff Notes version of it. Um, techniques that I think we should think about with with managing long-lived flags that we can't retire. Um, first thing, don't implement them the same way. Like if this is going to be in your code base for years, do not put like seven if conditionals in different parts of your code and think that that's okay. You are writing code that you're going to be reading and maintaining for multiple months or years. Do a good job. Like it's just like other code you're writing. Don't give yourself a hall pass like, oh, it's a feature flag. You're supposed to use if conditionals. Um, don't, don't do that. Uh, be aware that you're writing something that's going to be in your code base for a long time and treat it with respect. So um, you know, the, the, the biggest kind of takeaway for me is, is use techniques like polymorphism, strategy patterns, uh, policy patterns. Do not sprinkle if feature flag blah is on uh, all over your code base for, that you're going to be looking at for years and years. Um, they are expensive, try and limit them. So this gets to that question of like, if someone wants to just have more and more, like you have to somehow articulate the cost of this uh, in terms of the carrying cost of, of, of it slowing you down in, in your code. So don't, it's, it's, they're cheap to add and, and expensive to carry around. It's like branching, it seems like a good idea because you can just do it so easily, but uh, you pay the cost over time. So try and avoid playing that cost. Um, and then I, I think a, a lot of times, when you have a full featured feature flagging system, it's kind of the lowest path. It's the simplest way to get to add an ops toggle or uh, permissions toggles is to use the feature flagging system. Um, I think some teams sh should would benefit from considering building an actual legit separate system that's used for managing these things that are actually have a lot of different properties. Uh, on the outset, they feel like feature flags. Uh, they are feature flags, but they feel the same as an experiment flag. They're very different in a lot of ways. Um, putting them in a different system helps to kind of stop people from um, drifting too far into bad territory, I think. OK, so um, time to wrap it up. Um, so I said, I said at the beginning, and I've kind of said throughout this talk, that I think the thing that's great about feature flags is their broad applicability. Um, and I also think this is the key challenge that teams that are successful with feature flags have to work through is realizing that they're not just feature flags. They're different types of flags. You need to think about how you implement them differently. You need to manage them differently. Uh, and you need to plan to retire some of them, not other ones. Uh, and this is like the key to succeeding, I think, is just that epiphany of like, oh, we just called them all feature flags. But actually, they're very, very different things. And you need to manage them differently. So that's the kind of the big takeaway, I think. Uh, I'd like for people to get is there's different techniques, there's different ideas that you should apply depending on uh, what type of flag you have. Um, and that's, that's my talk. Uh, I really like talking about this stuff. I want to keep talking about this stuff and tell, tell all these silly stories. Uh, so come talk to me about it. 
Uh, you can also find me on Twitter. Um, you, there's contact information on, on my website if you want to keep, keep the conversation going. Um, thank you for your kind attention and interactivity. <laughs> Any last questions of just like broadly for before? Yeah. Uh, like why, so why would it sit at, like, uh, we'll take care of it next, because it shouldn't, shouldn't it mean nothing more than it So I think those are two questions, because there's a lot of tech debt, which is actually pretty simple to clean up, but there's always, like, feature work that's, that someone wants to do more. So I, f I think even if, it's, even if it's almost a freebie, um, unless you have a culture where people do this in their spare time, Unless you have kind of a hero culture where people do the stuff, like, like essentially you have a two-lane two system for work. There's like the work that the PM asks people to do, and then there's the work that the devs sneak in. Then sometimes that gets done. Uh, or you have like the 20% time. Um, so I think even if it's cheap to do, it still doesn't get done in my experience in some, in some places. And it can get pretty hairy. So if you've got a feature that was implemented in a lazy way, and has spread over time. And so now there's if conditionals in different parts of the code. The killer is if they affect shared mutable state. So like if this feature flag was on at some point in the past, at some point in the future, it's going to have an impact in code that doesn't even have that conditional there. That's, that's a really tricky thing to work with. If you had the pleasure of working in a dynamic language where it's actually hard to find where which thing is using this feature and you can't use the refactoring tools in your IDE, it can get it can get pretty bad. And it does and the thing is it doesn't need to be that bad in order for it to be too expensive for people to stop do it, to, to for people to be willing to do it. I think. Yeah. Uh, Henry you had a question? Yeah. Um, I think earlier when you started the presentation you mentioned uh, it's important to keep this metadata tracked. Mm -hmm. um, I think you mentioned it should be bundled with your feature flag. Yeah. So you have an in-house system, it, it, for, I guess for me, it comes with like the JSON blob. I think you also mentioned if you don't have that, then it would, you probably, would, that would probably live in a uh, system like Split. Um, what about the alternative, like keeping track of it in, a, in, in like a master document, like a spreadsheet? Yeah. Um, I'm seeing a lot of like, I, I guess, trade-offs with keeping it in the code base at least, because um, if somebody gets let go or, or like quits, now, I have to write a PR to update the code. Uh, no, we have a new owner for this. Or um, if a new system starts using this flag, well, I need to now update this flag's metadata yeah. to use this. And any, every every like key in the metadata, like I have to now like update yeah. all the time. Yeah. What are your thoughts about that? So broadly, I would like being a little bit mean. I would say. If it's hard for you to make changes to your system, you should make it easier to make changes to your system. You shouldn't stop. You shouldn't make the changes somewhere else. So if it hurts, do it more often. Pull the pain forward. Um, make it easier for you to make a config change. Like config change in general. Like a lot of times with teams, they say we need two paths to production. We need the code path and the config path because it's really expensive for us to change code and get it into production. This is actually probably a big uh, a, a benefit that customers get from uh, from things like split is it's a way for them to bypass all of that stuff um, nine times out of ten you should just be making it easier to get stuff into production like if it's hard to get stuff into production this way don't bypass it and create two forms of, of change make it easy to get stuff into production make there be one super smooth path invest in that and you get the benefits for a lot of stuff two forms of change, what you, which is config change versus code change so Code change goes through your C, CI, CD pipeline. You, you build it, you test it, blah, blah, blah. And then the feature flag change, uh, you just press the button and it happens in prod, <laughs> right? And the QAs find out uh, when they get in trouble. I mean, I'm, I'm being totally facetious. Most people don't do it that way. Um, but there's a risk, right, of having a config change be, uh, be able, uh, or a feature flag change, a something dynamic. Um, and there's value in doing it as well. For sure, but like I, I'm a super strong advocate of putting as much stuff into into your CD pipeline that is used all at the same time. That's like that's that's part of what I'd say. There's a bit of a smell there, but I think like if 
putting, putting it in a separate system and managing it that way is better than doing nothing at all, but there's a lot of benefit in having everything in one place, right? It's kind of like comments in your code right next to where the thing is versus in a wiki page which you forget to update and no one actually knows is there anymore. So having it there in one place makes it easier to manage and also it means that if you do have like a feature flagging system, you can see all of that information easily in one place. So you see the name of the flag, the performance metrics, uh, who's the owner of the flag, a description of the flag, like all of that can be gathered into one place, which is harder to do if it's in a spreadsheet. Okay. Yeah, we, we can talk, talk more yeah. about it as well. Um, other general questions? Okay, thank you.